Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Today's scripture reading is Jeremiah 29, 4 through 14, Isaiah 55, 1, and 6 through 12, Hosea 10 through 12. I just wanted everyone to know I'm very excited today to be able to read God's word, and I pray that you'll come listen to what the Lord has for us today. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them, and plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and become the fathers of sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will have welfare. For thus says the Lord of the hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets who are in your midst and your diviners deceive you and do not listen to the dreams which they dream for they prophesy falsely to you in my name i have not sent them declares the lord for thus says the lord when 70 years have been completed for babylon I will visit you and fulfill my good words to you, to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile. Ho! Oh, Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you will have no money. And you who have no money, come and buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk, without money and without cost. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord, and he will have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnish seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be, which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. For you will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you, and the trees of the field will clap their hands. Hosea. So, with a view to righteousness, reap in accordance with kindness. Break up your follow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord until he comes to rain righteousness on you. There are at least two times when 
the reading of God's word was so powerful and so intense that the people actually broke down and cried. One is when the temple was dedicated under Solomon. And uh, all these festivities, they began to read God's word. The other one was in relationship, actually, to some of the scriptures that Alice read today. And that's uh, the Babylonian captivity. And under Nehemiah, when he went back to rebuild the city walls, he had been preceded by Ezra. And Ezra had gone back to help rebuild the temple. So you had these two people that came out of captivity that went back. And when Ezra, they found the scripture in the temple rubble. And Ezra just stood up to begin reading. And all he did was he just read. And people just began to weep. And I sensed that same spirit this morning as, as Alice read this scripture today. Because it has so very much to say to us. I don't know if you could pick up on the on the, the scripture and the content of those words, but it's powerful because it speaks to us of the topic that we're going to be looking at this morning. And that's this whole idea. We've been talking now for four weeks, maybe, the, I don't know if this is the fourth or the fifth. I think this is the fifth Sunday in a row that we've been talking about revival and spiritual awakening. And as we come close to the end of our service or our season here with just one more Sunday left, as I prayed and asked the Lord what direction we needed to go in these last few weeks, this thought kept coming into my mind, and that is after all we've experienced and all we've learned about revival, as we've looked at some of the ancient historical revivals, like last week we looked a little bit at the Hebrides revival, I think. But what are we going to do with it when we get home? Um... I don't know how you are. I suspect you're a lot like I am uh, in that as a pastor, um, even, there are times when I'm inspired. I go to a conference someplace and I hear some great preaching, preaching, great singing, and so on. And I go back home enthused and excited and blessed. And yet, after a few days or a few weeks, I find myself sort of getting back to normal. You know, somebody said one time that the normal Christian life is so abnormal, or is so subnormal, that it appears to be abnormal when you see the normal. In other words, you and I were created by God to live in this intimate relationship with Him on an ongoing, constant basis. But because we, are, because we are sinners, I suppose you could say, and because we so often are distracted by other things, we end up a lot of times uh, going back into sort of a life-as-usual format. And so what I want us to do today is to just take a few minutes to look at some thoughts out of particularly the passage in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29. Because the children of Israel had been taken captive. They had gone through a very, very difficult time. And as they had gone through this time of being taken captive, they were following in the same footsteps that Israel, the, nor the northern tribes called Israel, had taken previously in 721 B.C., I think it was, when Syria captured the northern, ten northern tribes, they went by the name Israel, and took many of the people off into captivity. And then the Persian Empire came along a little over a hundred years later, and they conquered Syria, and as a result took control over God's people from those ten northern tribes. But Judah and Benjamin, that were the southern kingdom, became known as Judah, and they didn't go through that experience until 586 B.C. when then Babylon also took them captive. And in that experience, and their sin was the same as the sin of the northern tribes. They basically 
had turned their back on God. They had forgotten from when, where they came. And they had allowed themselves to be assimilated into the culture. And instead of influencing the culture, they let the culture influence them. And so they were practicing child sacrifice. They were practicing idolatry. They were practicing all forms of immorality. And, and in immersing themselves in the pagan cultures and the pagan practices of polytheism of the non-Jewish people. And in a lot of ways, we see this same thing happening in our countries, don't we? Because even though both Canada and the United States have a rich spiritual history, a vast heritage of walking with God, some of the greatest preachers in the world came not only from England and Germany, but also came from Canada and from the United States. J. Wilbur Smith, who was the pastor of the People's Church in Toronto, Canada for so many years, was one of the most prolific and profound preachers of North America for many years. And Stephen Olford, who became pastor of the Calvary Baptist Church in New York City, was a Canadian pastor. And of course, we all know, uh, you know, we can think of other people like that. But then we had people here in the United States like Jonathan Edwards and Billy Graham and W.A. Criswell and, and so forth and so on. So we've had our history, but you can't live on your history. You learn from it, but you don't live there. And there's all the difference in the world, and we need to understand that. And so the phrase or the theme that kept, keeps coming back through the scriptures that I asked Alice to read today is this idea of returning back to the Lord and seeking the Lord. So how do you return? I mean, if you're going to plan a trip, and return. Some of you will be returning. Most of you will be returning home someday. But how do you do that? How do you return? You get out and it becomes more than just a plan. It becomes action. So when we talk about returning to the Lord, we can talk about that all day long. And we can talk about the need for us to get back in and to go back and have those times of freshness with the Lord that we call revival. <laughs> But there has to be something on our end that we do, and that is, in this case, we make the first step. We seek the Lord. We seek the Lord. You will never find him. What did Jesus say to, in the, the Sermon on the Mount? Seek, and you will what? Find. Knock, and it will be opened, you see. And so that's where we are. And we have to find a way to put spiritual feet to the impulses and the heart cry of our lives. Because there is within each of us that innate instinctive drive to live in a close relationship with God. And it's because we were designed that way. And so this term, seek the Lord, actually appears 29 times in the Bible. And almost all of them are in the Old Testament. And the idea of seeking him in this scripture alone in the chapter 29 chapter of Jeremiah, the idea of seeking the Lord is referred to five times. And so when Judah ended up in Babylon, it's interesting how it happened. Because in 597, well, Jeconiah was, uh, was one of the kings. Now, the interesting thing about it depends on which, the, uh, which uh, scholar you look at, but he was either 8 years old or 18 years old when he became king. And he only was king for a little over three months. And the Babylonian soldiers came in and took him and his entire family and all of the elites of Jerusalem, all the white collar, the acad academics, the theologians, the scholars, and took them all off to Babylon and left just the blue-collar people in Jerusalem. And so when Jeconiah went, was taken and was taken captive, captive to, to Babylon, there was something that happened in the rest of Judah. First of all, in that process, they took the priests as well. 
And unfortunately, some of the priests who had preceded them, they had been compromised and had been acclimated to the culture for several years, so that when the children of Israel got, when the Jewish captives got there, uh, they ended up, if you remember the scripture that Alice read a little bit ago, uh, they began to say things that were not true. They began to claim to have dreams that were not from God, and they were misleading the people. But the first thing that happened with the children, with the Jewish people, was that they had this spiritual separation from God. Not only were they spiritually separated, but they were also geographically separated. And they were not back home where they were comfortable and where they were accustomed to. But perhaps the most important thing that happened to them, other than being spiritually separated, is that there was this sensual, a sense of cultural alienation because all of their cultural resources had been taken away and they were it was gone. And so in the 29th chapter, in the earlier part of the verses of that chapter, God gives these people who have been taken captive, he gives them some counsel. And it's very interesting what he tells them to do and this was the problem that Judah was facing, and we see this in verse 5 through 7, particularly 5 actually through 9. And the roaring that is used there, it says to build houses and live in them and plant gardens and eat their produce. When I read that, I thought, in other words, what, they're, what, what God is telling them is, you've got a long road ahead of you before you get back to your land. So be prepared for the long haul. One of the things that really has struck my mind this past week as I've done further study on revival and as I've been listening to reports of revival from different parts of the world is that, for example, the Asbury revival that started on the 8th of February this past year. People have a tendency to expect great things out of that too quickly. Revival is like a fruit it takes time, once it is born, it takes time for it to mature and ripen. And that's the way it is with a revival. And if you know anything, remember anything from what we've talked about these past few weeks, we've talked about how people were praying. For example, the missionaries in the Shandong province of North China, they prayed from 1925 to 1935. Ten years they prayed before revival broke. But when revival broke, it changed the entire country. And it prepared them for the adversity of communism. And yet today, the church in China is the largest and fastest growing house church movement in the world. And whereas in the 1980s, there were somewhere around 50 million Christians in China, today there are over 400 million Christians. So we need to be ready for whatever and however long it takes. What, and that's in your own personal life as well. You can make a decision. It's like being born. I mean, you're born in one instant. Somebody commented this morning about my, you know, when I was born, my birthday, and I, and, and they wanted to know, you know, what time of the day were you born? And I thought, well, I don't remember. <laughs> I was there, but I don't remember. And. And that's kind of the way we are. You know, we're born, but then it takes time for us to grow up. And that's the way it is with revival. And that's the way it is with us on a personal level. And so don't get impatient with this whole idea of revival breaking out. And then the second thing that we see in verse 6 is he says, you get married, have kids. Have your kids get married, let them have kids. In other words, multiply, make the best of what the circumstances around you are. And one of the easy things for us to do in a culture in which we live is it's easy for us to complain. I know one of the guys talked about, uh, well, in fact, I was Randy uh, last Thursday in the men's Bible study, prayer breakfast, was talking about how he just had made a decision in his life that he was not going to overburden himself, you know, overly so with 
with news and, and information that didn't profit him, did not benefit him spiritually and emotionally and mentally. We learned to live, and Paul made this comment to the Philippian Christians. He was talking about times when he had all the, all the resources he needed, and there were other times when he didn't have enough resources, and he uh, was short on food, or short on clothes, or short on, on funds. And, but he said, I have come to the point that whatever state I'm in, I'll be content. And then this interesting statement, make, seek the welfare of the city. I don't know if you thought about this or not. You know, so many of the Christians that I know, uh, they're anxious to get out of here and get to heaven. And I'm, I'm ready. Maranatha is my middle name. Even so, come Lord Jesus. But the fact is, re remains that if God wanted to take me on home, he'd have done that. There are plenty of opportunities he's had to do that. But what I need to understand is that while I'm here, God wants me to be salt and light. So wherever you are, whatever, whether your town is a town of 150 people or you're in a metropolitan area of three or four million people, seek the welfare of your city. Wherever you are, wherever you live, whether it's Canada, the United States, or some other country, while you are where you are waiting for revival and waiting for Christ's return, make your priority to make your community better. This is what Jesus talked about, didn't he, on the Sermon on the Mount? He told us how we ought to live in very practical ways. And then he goes on and he says, Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you, where I have sent you into exile, and pray on its behalf, on your city's behalf, so that in its welfare, you will have welfare. And yet one of the things that we are probably most negligent about is praying for our cities, praying for our officials, praying for our government leaders, praying for our teachers, praying for those people that are in positions of leadership and responsibility. And then the last thing that he talks about in verses 8 to 9 is don't give in to the false statements and false claims that so-called prophets claim to have. You can't listen to what the world offers. And even those people that, that are followers of Christ can often mislead you. I have a real caution whenever I hear any Christian, whether it's on television or just in a personal conversation, saying, I have a word from God for you. I won't chase that rabbit any further but you understand what I'm saying because God spoke to Israel and said or to, the, to Judah and said don't let your prophets that are in your midst and your diviners deceive you and don't listen to the dreams that they dream for they prophesy falsely to you in my name so you have to be careful so that's all that God is saying to, is to, to Judah before this key passage that we will look at today. And that is that God gave them one thing he wanted them to do while they were in captivity. Not only those that were in captivity, captivity in Babylon, but those who were also in captivity still in Judah. And that was seek him. Seek God's face. You know, and that's too simple. I mean, think about it. We have so, so many complicated problems that we're challenged with. And, and the answer can't be as simple as just seeking God. Over and over and over in the Psalms, the psalmist wrote, Early will I seek you. I will seek you. I will seek after you. David made this comment, and he says, As the deer, in Psalm 42, I think it is, or Psalm 40, As the deer cries out for the water brook, so my soul pants and cries out for you, O God. 
there has to be a personal inner craving, and, and, and can I, I'm mean, just being really honest with you, but, but one of the biggest struggles that we're all going to have when this chapel season is over is we're going to lose our appetite for him. Because right now, while we're together, we enjoy the fellowship, we enjoy the worship and the singing and, the, and, and all the other things that we do together, but in just a couple of weeks, that's done. And it's going to be easy to be distracted about the projects you have waiting for you back home, the neighbors that you haven't seen since last fall, and so forth. And spending time in God's presence and seeking His face, just, just not, not to get an answer, just to be in His presence. I mean, you don't come to God only when you need an answer to a prayer. You come to Him to be with Him. Yesterday was a very busy day for, for me personally, and Joanne had a lot of time on her hands. And about 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon, I was still in the office working on today's sermon and bulletin and so on, and she wanted to know if I was still there. <laughs> and she said, I'm getting lonely out here. And so... I sometimes think God maybe is kind of that way. He says, where have you been? I'm lonely. You haven't come to see me lately. And there's something special. And when I finally came in and sat down, she leaned her head over on my shoulder and took my hand. And I didn't know quite what she was going to do. <laughs> but it turned out to be okay. But we are to seek Him, and the three things that you see in the study guide, if you're following that, is to seek Him exclusively. There's three times in that 13th verse that God uses the personal pronoun, me. He doesn't say, seek a blessing. He doesn't say, seek an experience. He doesn't say, seek a group. All He says is, seek me. Now, I know that this has a historical setting to it. That's obvious. But it also has a great truth for us to understand. And that is that as we recognize the need for revival, and obviously we need it, the way back is going to be on our part. And whatever else happens in circumstances, we have to be willing to come to a place in our lives where we say, I will seek Him, and I will seek Him, the rest of my life, and I will choose to be a, the life of a seeker constantly longing to be in God's presence because that's where God is and that's where, because He is there, everything He has is there, and it's in God's presence that the Bible tells us there is fullness of joy there is peace, there is joy everlasting, there is hope. All of the different things that you need, God is. I want to say that again. All of the things that you need, God is. And so, as you think about what's going to happen when you go back home, even if home is here, what should be your priority? to seek God's face on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you do that, then everything else is going to come together. <laughs>